Ward Air 306 by the marker of six right. Say what? Ho, oh, this is Brian. Call me Freddie Bannister Gardner, coming to you from Ramblon Towers uh, Kitchen Studio. Uh, I'm in the servants' quarters today in scenic Hespler, Ontario, and you are listening to Ramblon Radio, episode number 68. It seems like ages ago I was talking about two thirds of the way to 666, and here we are at 68, only two episodes later. Huh. Ramblon Radio is the only dedicated Led Zeppelin podcast on this or any other known internets. Be sure to go to RambleOnRadio.com for all your Led Zeppelin news. Any links I mentioned during the show, you can subscribe to Ramble on Radio through iTunes. Um, if you go to iTunes, leave a review. It helps with, uh, it's a placement thing. It helps us with placement. Listen on Spreaker. Um, and, and be sure to follow Ramble on Radio if you go to Spreaker and listen. Uh, again, helps with placement. Helps things out. Um, and check it out at Ramble on Radio on YouTube. Um, follow Ramble On Radio on Facebook, Google+, and at Ramble On Blog on Twitter. And if you want to have a conversation on any one of those formats, I try Google+, I don't check very much. But otherwise, I try very, very hard and to keep up with stuff. So it looks like uh, when I went for the summer vacation, I actually went into summer hours all over. Uh, so last week didn't happen just because last week did not happen. Uh, habits and whatnot. <laughs> Dying hard. Um, yeah, taking, some, taking it a bit easier in the summer. And I did have a full uh, idea for last week. But that's okay because it works this week too. And we're going to go with a bigger... Uh, we're going to talk... Anyway, you, by the intro you can tell we're going to talk about Nebworth. Nebworth, 1979. 35 years ago this past week was the second date. The first one, uh, August 4th, 1979, happened uh, about... Um, nine days ago now, uh, 35 years ago and nine days. Um, and, and the Ward Air stuff was, I've told the story early in the podcast, but I'm sure a lot of you weren't listening at that point. Um, um, the Ward Air story goes, um, Ward Air is considered one of the great airlines. People talk about its service, everything was so great. My Ward Air experience is on August 3rd, 1979, I was flying to London with my family. I was 16 years old. It was a family vacation would be the last one I would ever take with them. Um, and uh, we, we were, the plane was late. Uh, and we were staying at an uncle's who, who was a uh, uh, prison guard at Wardsworth Prison. And he, was meet, he met us at the airport, you know, and he says, when we get back to their place, it's about 2.33 in the afternoon. We were supposed to be in for, for 11, 12. And... Um, my aunt says, well, you know, we have the girl next door. She's going to take you because they're going, what are we going to do with a 16-year-old boy? Um, and in fairness, I was a pretty miserable one at that. So she says, well, we have the girl next door. She's going to take you. She's going to take you out one night and do something um, fun with you, take you to the club or something. She says, um, we had tickets to a concert today, but they had to leave. They all, you know, there was a bunch of them, and we, we got you one too um, if you wanted to go. But uh, they had to leave. Uh, and, of course, the concert was uh, Nebworth. Uh, so that's how close I came to actually seeing a 16-year-old, like I'm wearing a spray-painted, hand, you know, air-painted air Jimmy Page T-shirt. I have a, a jean jacket with a Robert Plant um, decal on the back of it. I'm a complete, com 
complete Led Zeppelin freak. Uh, my one thing looking for when I'm in England is in through the outdoor because the rumor was it was being released earlier in England than it was in Canada or in North America. Um, and and I guess because probably because the dates have been pushed back so many times, the rumor was it was already out in England, but it's going to be a few weeks here. So I was going there with one thing in mind. I want to get my hands on that record. I did come home with that record, by the way. And if you're in North America, and you should know that they did not shrink wrap them in England the way they do in North America, and therefore the brown paper bag is smooth instead of crumpled. The, in North America, the brown paper bag tended to crumple up, tended to get binded. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about In Through the Outdoor next week, because it, it comes up on the, I think it's the 20th is the date. So it kind of comes up next Wednesday, something like that, as the actual date of release. So we're going to talk about In Through the Outdoor next week. Uh, this week we're going to talk Nebworth uh, 1 and 2. Um, but that's my Nebworth story. That's how close I can be that close. So when everybody tells you Ward Air, ah, oh, Ward Air, great service. Ward Air is great. Best airline ever. Ward Air kept me from seeing Led Zeppelin. All you ever need to know about them. Uh, I do not like them as much as others. <laughs> i got to mention, the seats were comfortable. I'll give you that. It's, uh, uh, if you're younger and you've only ever traveled in the modern era, you don't know what you're missing. It was, it was something else. Big, comfortable seats. Big plane with room. They had a bar upstairs. It's a jumble jet, and they actually had a bar upstairs. Um, quite something. Anyway, so Robert Plant's announced some dates, um, added some dates, whatever. Um, give me an idea. You know, you wonder why he doesn't want to do the Zeppelin reunion and stuff. Um, here we have probably over two weeks, five dates over two weeks. So if he was, you know, if it was Live Nation one night, they'd be doing every other night. They'd be doing two nights out of three or something like that. They'd be cramming the shows in. Um, this is the way Robert Plant wants to roll. On September 25th, he's in New York. On September 30th, five days later, he's in Toronto. On October 2nd, three days later, he's in Chicago. Denver, October 4th. October 7th, Los Angeles. So 10 days, five dates, New York to L.A. L.A. to New York, New York to L.A. Um... With a border crossing into Toronto, takes gives himself five days to get across the border. Um, that's going nice and slow and easy. Um, on Port Chester, New York, by the way. I'm not sure exactly where that is. Um, I'm guessing it's in the New York City area, but I don't know for sure. Meanwhile, this week he played Glasnevin Abbey uh, this weekend. Uh, and looking over the set list, it was, in fact, 50%. And 14 songs, I think it was seven or Zeppelin. Um, three new songs. Interesting, by the time he comes to Massey Hall in Toronto, the new album will be out, uh, or to Port Chester or whichever. And I'm planning on going to Massey Hall. I figure I'll be going to Massey Hall. Um, unless, you know, you know, things can change. Um, but... Um, Three new songs from the new album. I figure by the time he gets to drum, he's dropping five or six new songs, don't you think? Um, just kind of makes sense. Uh, I think he played Little Abbey, the one about being loud, something loud, and um, I don't think it was Rainbow. It was uh, uh, Golden, whatever. Oh, damn. Oh, this is very, very bad. This is bad. This is very bad. Um, I'm going to have to roll up the web page. Uh, forgive me on this one. Um, but uh, they, they, they did release, he released a single this week. Uh, the second single from the album. First one was first one was Rainbow. The second one, Pocket Full of Golden. I think that's the song they did at the show. It was Little Maggie Pocket Full of Golden. And the one about, um, uh, damn, something, all, yeah. Anyway, um, not the most relevant thing. But, uh, and so they released Pocket Full of Golden as a single this week. Uh, or was it last week? May, it may have been last week. But it's out there. It's on iTunes. You can, if, if you bought the album, you got an email telling you to, you know, take your download. Um, which I did. Uh, but it's, uh, it's available on iTunes. probably available on Amazon.com by now. It wasn't last week. But it's probably available by now. Um, 
All right, but that's, yeah, uh, that's what we can expect from our plan, right? 14, 15 songs. There's going to be a bunch of Zeppelin in there, and there's going to be a bunch of other stuff. Um, okay, so um, a new book by, a new Robert Plant book. Remember last year there was a Robert Plant, Unauthorized Biography. This year there's another one by Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson's done a ton of books. My favorite music, my absolute favorite music book is a Dave Thompson book um, called I Hate New Music. <laughs> and it's a cynical, cynical look. Uh, and, and the basic thesis is the, the late 1970s, 76, 77, ruined music. Um, it basically turned it into um, uh, it's basically turned it in, in by uh, the Boston Fleetwood Mac rumors, Eagles Hotel California, etc. Those albums, uh, Frampton Comes Alive, changed the music business from a, a artist driven business, from a musician driven business to a uh, sales-driven business, turn it into a big high-end business. So um, once, the, once the big shots, once you know, guys like M MGM and um, the big corporations realized there were hundreds of millions of dollars to be made selling records, uh, it was over. Uh, it was no longer, before that, the artists had a lot of freedom and if they sold a few records and made a few million dollars for everybody, everybody was happy. But once the accountants got in there, uh, so that's his thesis, and it's an excellent. It's such a cynical, uh, fun, excellent read. Uh, and the good news is, I've asked for a review copy, been told it, it, I'll get it, um, and also been uh, seems I've been offered an interview with Dave Thompson. So um, uh, I hope you guys maybe want to go read "I Hate New Music" uh, <laughs> because I have a feeling that's what I'd talk to him. About. <laughs> but yeah, um, so hopefully that'll happen. Hopefully that'll happen in October. We'll get Dave Thompson on. Um, he's also done, he did a book last year I got for Christmas on Roger Waters. Uh, he did one on the Stones. I'm trying to think of who else. But yeah, he's done a lot of books and he's, he's quite good. And he's not, like the Roger Waters one's not fawning. He's not, um, um, you know, he presents him warts and all and even admits the warts and all. Uh, he doesn't just, um, um, you know, he, he doesn't try to candy. He doesn't try to bash him, but he doesn't try to candy coat him either. Um, so I, it's, I think it'll be a fair book, and uh, it should be a good one. Uh, there's another book uh, by Hypnosis, uh, the the guys who make album covers, and I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce this. H y p g n o i. I think it's a strange spelling, and it's meant to be artistic, I guess. Uh, but I think it's Hypnosis is is the actual. Um, uh, anyway, they did. Physical Graffiti, they did you know, Presence, they did Houses of the Holy. Um, they did some Pink Floyd, they did, you know, famously um, Wish You Were Here. Uh, that's sort of the, quite a number of them. And, and there's a hardcover book coming out. Uh, and by the guys, it'd be $42, by the way, on Amazon.com. And, um, it, you know, it'll be... It'll, yeah, pictures. It, they, there is out there now a couple alternate takes of pictures from uh, Houses of the Holy Shoot. Um, so it'll give it to give you an idea of what it's going to be like. This, the alternate takes, including one I think where Robert Plant's crawling up the thing, crawling up the uh, Giant's Causeway. Um, Robert Plant is also doing an intro to the book. He's penned an intro, so. Uh, and then we go into November, uh, November 3rd, you know, we talked last time, Jimmy Page is going to be speaking at the um, West Side Y, I think it is, or Upper West Side Y, the Har it's the one in Harlem, actually. Um, uh, he, that's on the 3rd of November, on the 5th of November, he's actually going to be signing hardcover copies of his book, Jimmy Page, by Jimmy Page, it's the photo book that, um, that he sold uh, for a number of thousands of dollars. through Genesis publication uh, two years ago. Um, and everybody was getting it with their, they were getting white gloves to, uh, to look at the book and stuff. So this is the hardcover version. It will be available at Barnes & Noble and that sort of thing. And he's going to be at Barnes & Noble in Manhattan on November 5th, uh, two days after speaking at the Y, to, uh, um, to sign some books. So apparently he'll be speaking. Apparently you have to buy the books from Barnes & Noble. A receipt. Uh, saying such is a requirement to get in uh, and don't necessarily expect a signature. 
it depends. There, there'll be a lineup around the block, they figure, and it'll go on as long as it goes on, and that'll be all. Um, but apparently, he will be there signing and speaking of it. So, uh, well, that's all the kind of news right now. That's all the news. Oh, yeah, that's it. Bye. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's only 15 minutes long. i got to speak about something else. Um, the next up, uh, Nebworth. We're, we're going to talk. So, on, on, uh, on, uh, in, in August, in 1979, the band had been laid off after Robert Plant's son's death. Um, and, of course, he went home and, and um, crawled into bed for six months or, or whatever you do when your child is, dies like that. Um, I can't imagine what you would do, uh, how you get up out of, out of bed on a given day. So, But I know people who've been through it, and it seems to take them about two weeks to get out of bed, and then another two weeks to decide that they desperately need normalcy in their life, if nothing else, and try to get on with it. Um, which kind of what Robert Plant did through 1978. So he popped it. He appeared periodically. Um, but 79, the band got back together. And, well, it's late 78, and started recording a new album. Uh, and they wanted to release the album and some kind of a bang with it. They wanted to do a show, the small tours. They thought of something. And they came up with Nebworth. Nebworth, they had, uh, is a big festival, uh, was a big festival in London or in England. Uh, it takes place actually in Stevenage. Stevenage. Um, Nebworth is not a town, by the way. Nebworth is, I don't know what it is. I don't know why the K is silent. I know virtually I'd never been able to understand it. And believe me, as a 16-year-old reading about this concert that was going on, um, we were pretty sure they were playing at Knebworth. Which is fair game, because I had a friend called Mark Knuster, and uh, the K was certainly not silent there, so you give me the K-N and I'll go Knu. Um, King Knut, you know. Um, but I believe it's actually Nebworth, not Knebworth. Um, <laughs> but, so they decided to do the show, and then Peter Grant got involved and started talking about, we got the big vans, and, and started talking two shows. Um, so they put one show on sale. Um, by some accounts, they sold about 140,000 tickets overall between the two shows. By other accounts, by Peter Grant's accounts, closer than they were to 250,000. Um, it ended up being quite a bit of fighting uh, between Freddie Bannister, who ran the Nebworth Festival, and, and the band, specifically Peter Grant, over how many people were there, how many paid tickets, etc., etc., uh, Bannister insists, insists 140,000 paid tickets, no more than 150,000 people between the two days. Um, Grant insists it's closer to 250,000. Um, and had um, had photographs taken in the chopper, had a chopper go up with fo and photographs taken that he sent to NASA for um, evaluation. And, and supposedly they told him, yes, 250,000 is what you're looking at. So, and the fighting, so that that meant that the money that went to Zeppelin was, well, um, there was infighting. And the fighting and the money and whatnot ended up bankrupting Bannister. <laughs> it ended up, almost killed the festival. It, it uh, did continue, but it did not continue under Freddie Bannister. Uh, it continued thereafter, uh, put on by, by a radio station. Um, there was talk about, like, Little River Band, Little Feet... Um, um, bands like that backing up the Nebworth Festival because uh, it's a festival so it's supposed to be six or seven bands um, for various reasons none of them would have could, could do it uh, the band was apparently very keen on Little Feet apparently big fans and if you're not if you've never heard Little Feet uh, I really they are a great they are a really good band and uh, head on out and, and find their greatest hits album um Find their post-70s album called Let It Roll, which is exceptionally good music. Um, but beyond that, you know, they, they, there's a Greatest Hits album, and uh, it's really worth checking out. They're a good band. But anyway, they, the, apparently the guys in Led Zeppelin were big fans and wanted them to be part of the opening. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, all sorts of other bands uh, were mentioned. 
and it ended up being Commander Cody and his Lost Planet Airmen, Chaz and Dave, which I don't really know them, but apparently they're half comedy, half um, half music, and died. Just died on that stage two weeks in a row. Um, they were going to have um, the Rod's, uh, uh, Ron Wood's band with uh, Keith Richards. It's Officially it was Woody's band, but Richards was also in it called the uh, uh, New Barbarians, um, but they couldn't make the first, the August 4th show, uh, because um, uh, Stones were recording. They had obligations there. So they did do the second week. They did not do the first week. Uh, the first week was Todd Rundgren's Utopia, a decent band, but probably out of place for the show. Um, but as night fell, look, they, you know, people put up with these bands, uh, you know, when when it's when there's six bands, all of them are good at a good festival. You know, and you see, like I, in the '70s, I saw, you know, Aerosmith, Ted Nugent, Nazareth, um, and then three lesser bands, all of which were good. Uh, you know, Moxie, a local band called Moxie. Um, you, you get bands, you get shows like that, with full shows by big bands um, and it's worth you know it's worth mentioning like Nazareth and Ted Nugent were fairly big acts at the time they were headlining acts themselves they would do the Maple Leaf Gardens they would come around in the winter to Maple Leaf Gardens so in there you know um, it was debatable whether Errol Smith or, or or Nazareth or Ted Nugent would actually should actually open that or close that festival and um uh, I didn't stick out Aerosmith. Uh, you know, I had seen enough by them. Uh, mind you, they were it was, but they were bad. They were at, in a bad place at that time. But um, that's that's what a festival is supposed to be like. Not five minor acts and a major act. And when you get five minor acts and a major act, it's really just everybody sitting around waiting for these other guys to get off stage, so we can get to the Led Zeppelin. <laughs> and that's what happens. That's what happened. But eventually, night fell. And uh, Zeppelin took the stage. You heard in the intro um, the opening chords of A Song Remains the Same. The set list went like this. Set list for set night one was The Song Remains the Same into Celebration Day. Black Dog with Out, of the, Out in the Tiles as the intro. Same as they were doing in around 73. Nobody's Fault But Mine, Over the Hills of Far Away, Misty Mountain Hop, Since I've Been Loving You, a rip-roaring version on August 4th, by the way. No Quarter, Ten Years Gone, Hot Dog, The Rain Song. White Summer, Black Mountainside, Cashmere, all in, into one, right? It's White Summer, Black Mountainside, um, and then straight into Cashmere. Trembled Underfoot, Sick Again, Achilles Last Stand, then they did a, the violin bow solo um, and a drum intro into In the Evening and Stairway to Heaven. Encore, Rock and Roll, Whole Lot of Love, Heartbreaker. And at the encores, they walked off stage after every song, five minutes of audience banging their, banging their feet and stuff. Um, before Heartbreaker, Robert Plant came out, they sang... You'll Never Walk Alone, which apparently is a big deal in Britain. I have no idea. Uh, I don't understand this whole soccer song <laughs> thing. So that's, but that's, that's the show. Um, some real highlights in this show. Uh, Achilles' Last Stand is dynamite. And if you have the, the, um, the 1992, no, by 2002, they did the DVD. Um, and they did, they showed Achilles' Last Stand from this show. And it's dynamite, on fire. Um, Cashmere is another one where they're on fire on this particular night. Um, some sloppy, some, you know, there are times when Paige is really not there, and, and obviously he's into the drugs by this point. Uh, and Robert has some difficulty um, with his voice at, at some points. He seems to have a hard time, fine, especially early on. As the show goes along, he gets better. Since I've Been Loving You is also a rip roaring version, really good version. Um, I love this show. I listen to this show all the time. It's one I keep on my iPod. And I love this. It's got its faults, but overall, wow. And, and maybe psychologically, it's because it's the one I was almost at. Um, but it's a wow show to me. Uh, the second show is the same set list, except, uh, and I have to think about this, Ten Years Gone doesn't make the cut here. Uh, and it's presumed this is just, they have some technical problems. And they do have some technical problems in the middle of the show some feedback and stuff, and, and it seems as though um, 10 Years Gone just got cut because of that. And then at the encore, instead of, um, they, they put in, um, instead of Heartbreaker, it's Communication Breakdown. 
Uh, and I think otherwise it's the exact same set list. Some celebration of black dog. Nobody's fault of mine. Nobody else far away. Miss Mountain Ops. I've been loving you. No quarter hot dog rains on. Night summer line rains on. Today's last night. Um, and again, some really, really hot performances on this particular night. Um, um, since I've been loving you is an interesting one. Um, they, the chorus, they almost let it go organ and voice. Although, and organ, drums, and voice. And it becomes almost a croony type song. And it's a very interesting, almost a retake on it. And, um, um, it's, it's just a different kind of take on it. And, and it just seems to be Paige fell away for, for a verse and, um, and let the other guys do it. But boy, it, it really is a different sound to it. And it, uh, but it's an interesting sound. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's, it sounds great. So that's the show as they did it. Um, it got between. It got reviewed quite poorly, actually, in many ways. Um, and I, I've mentioned this before. At the time, the British press was—they were into the punk, um, and that's all they cared about. They thought this was the greatest thing in the world. All the Sex Pistols, all the Clash, <laughs> and they—they—they they, they, they used the line all the time. And if you read Dave uh, Dave Lewis's book on Nebworth, which he is. Uh, has redone, re um, added 40% new material, etc., etc., uh, and has available on his website, tblweb.com, tight but loose. Uh, Dave Lewis, um, he did his book. Oh, I, I forget the title offhand. I meant to have it in my hand because I, I did reread it over the last couple of days in preparation. You see, I do prepare for the show. Um, I do. I prepare. I was prepared. <laughs> So I read the book, and and, and uh, what was I saying about it? Though? Um, gotta go backwards here. Gotta go backwards. Think it through. Um, nah, I can't remember. Can't remember. <laughs> Jesus, that's bad. Oh, I completely lost my train of thought here. What show are we talking about? Ooh, 77? Um, 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 oh yeah, in between. So the, 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 the reviews constantly referred to them as dinosaurs. And it's the most, like the first guy who wrote that, Led Zeppelin, and these rock acts are dinosaurs. Uh, kudos, it's clever enough as far as it goes. Um, beyond that, it's unoriginal, uninspiring, and not the brightest thing. It's not that clever that it needs to be repeated ad nauseum. And if you, the only thing, if you're a writer sitting down to write a review of anything, and the only thing you got in your kit bag is to call Led Zeppelin Dinosaurs, it's 1979, and that's what you got, find another job. You're not good enough. Period. And a story. If that's what you wrote, if you're sitting out there going, oh, I kind of wrote that, I hope you found another career because you're not a good enough writer. You're not a clever enough human being to be a decent writer. Um, it's a bullshit line, and it was nonsense then. It's nonsense now. 150,000 people, 100 and some odd, 10,000 people. That first show they talk, uh, even Freddie Bannister admits there was 100,000 people at that first show. 100,000 people showed up from all around the world to see this band. And, and what do these guys got to say? Oh, nobody was into it. <laughs> They're dinosaurs. They're not dinosaurs, but, the, you know, had, had the Clash been headlining it, would 100,000 people have showed up? No. Had the Sex Pistols? No. And if you like the Sex Pistols, you can hardly complain about the noise of Led Zeppelin uh, because they bashed and crashed and banged, and that's about where they came from. Um, and I understand the art form as, as far as it goes. I understand the the uh, model that supposedly um, they follow. But you can't like them and then complain Led Zeppelin's noisy or Led Zeppelin's incoherent or Led Zeppelin's sloppy, <laughs> you know? But that's what they were doing. And then they were calling them a dinosaur because they had nothing. They had they went to a show with their little kit bag of, of phrases in their back pocket. And, and, you know, if it was really a bad, look, if it's really a bad show, you have something to write. If you want to bash them and, and you go and it's a terrible show, you have something to write. You don't need to reach into the cliche bag. Um, 
But Robert Plant, throughout the second show, Robert Plant actually mentions the reviews a few times. And he's, he's not pleased with what, uh, what was written. And he actually comments on some reviews, I guess, from In Through the Outdoor, which apparently were also not positive. And you still get the not positive reviews of In Through the Outdoor. Um, but uh, I, and I'm trying to remember, you know, I was in, in like I say, we landed in England for a three-week family vacation on the 4th. Uh, by the 11th, we were in Ireland at, at the family home in Belfast. And um, so there was no chance, by the way, I was getting to that show. That wasn't, I, didn't, I don't think I ever brought it up. I don't think I even thought of, considered the possibility myself. Um, but uh, I'm trying to remember reading the reviews or reading anything about it, and I must have. Um, but I don't really recall doing so. Um, the, I mean, the radio was constantly on. BBC is constantly on. And if you're over there in 1979, everybody listens to the same radio station um, in 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 the UK, and uh, it was constantly on. They watched the same TV shows, like they had Top of the Pops TV show, which was all the latest bands, and and my granny watched it. Um, bitched about the songs, oh, and I remember I don't like Mondays was was number one at the time. Um, and uh, if you're here in North America, you'll go, wait a minute, wasn't it cold when uh, Don't Like Mondays? Yes, January-ish was when that song hit in North America, but it was July, it was the number one song in the UK. Uh, and it is one of the things I took home with me, is a single of, of I Don't Like Mondays. And I remember her complaining about the song. <laughs> so, uh, and how whiny Bob Geldof sounds. And stuff. So, but everybody, like my mother, my parents wouldn't have a clue what music was so popular would not know um, if I was listening to I Don't Like Mondays or whatever else. Um, but, you know, even my granny knew what the pop, what the top of the pop songs because they all listen to the same radio station. They all listen to. And, and if you're a pop fan, too bad. For 20 hours a day, you got classical or you got brass band or you got news or you got uh, opera. Um, and if you were an opera fan, too bad, because 20 hours a day, you got rock and news and Broadway show tunes. And if you like jazz, and too bad, because 20 hours a day, you got opera and rock. And, and, and if you like the news, then too bad, because you got music for 20 hours. And, and so they kind of split things up that way so that everybody got, there was a little something for everybody over the course of the week. Apologies, I had to shut that out for a minute. I had an intrusion into the recording studio. Um, take this. The teenage boy is up before noon. It's 11.57 and he just emerged. Uh, it's the first time I've seen him before noon in ages. Um. <laughs> wow. And he's working afternoon. In fairness, he works afternoon shifts. He's getting home at midnight. So he's, he's living on a, on a nighttime world. Um, which sounds like a kiss song. Anyway, so I don't recall hearing much of these negative reviews. Uh, I know back in North America, we, you know, later on in the summer, going back to school, you pick up a few reviews, and I recall them being positive. I recall, I, I recall kind of, we looked for, we would actually looked for bootlegs for this, and, and I never was successful. Everybody else, through the seven days, they bought bootlegs. I was never successful in finding bootlegs. Uh, it was in the early 80s when I, my first one, and it was a cassette. It was just a pre-recorded cassette. And it may be a case that I was too damn cheap to actually buy a bootleg. That uh, I, I saw them, but then went, I'm not spending $60 on a record. <laughs> Maybe the case. But um, um, I don't recall the negative reviews. Uh, anyway, anyway. So that's it. It was 35 years ago this week that Led Zeppelin re-emerged from um, their kind of their down uh, period uh, after the 70s from the you know 77 tour from after well after after uh, the Earl's Court shows in 75 from there to the end of the 77 tour until this it was very much a down period for the band um, emotionally as well as activity wise. Um, and they emerged really quite successful, really quite gloriously. Um, they, they were on top of the world for a little while again. 
And uh, it's too bad they didn't have the chance to grow that. Um, too bad they didn't grow it immediately after. They didn't come out, out of the gate growing that um, success, growing what they did in net worth. Um, you know, I think if they'd have been playing by mid-September some shows in Europe or something, they would, uh, you know, they, they may have emerged much stronger. Um, as it was, they put in a lot of time and a lot of rehearsal for two shows. Um, and that's that's a pity. And it would be another almost a year before they would would be another year before they played again. Uh, yeah, it would be like August, July, August, nineteen eighty, when they played Europe. <clears throat> so it was, uh, and it, you know, this was in many ways it was not. Well, nobody knew it. It was a swan song. It was a farewell, and uh, it's a significant milestone in rock history. It's a significant milestone in Led Zeppelin history, and it was again thirty five years ago this week. So that's it. That's that's the talk on Knebworth, 1979. Um, by the way, it, worth noting, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant would re, 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 reunite on the Knebworth stage in, I believe it was 1990, where they played rock and roll. Robert Plant was actually performing um, and did some did a fair set with his own band. Played you know, um, Talk Who won, uh, Liars Dance, I think. Um, Tied on the highway, I think, but I'm not sure. And and then um, and then Jimmy came on, and they did Wearing and Tearing, which is from the uh, uh, Into the Outdoor Sessions, but did not make the album, and they never played before or since, I believe, live. Um, then there was um, Rock and Roll, and I think Whole Lot of Love. So they did reunite on that stage ever so briefly, 11 years later. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if the festival still goes on now. I don't think so. But uh, it did go into the 90s, and it's been a number of significant acts uh, have played that festival. Pink Floyd, Rolling Stones, Leonard Skinner owned it one year, apparently. Um, absolutely owned it. And, um, but none maybe bigger than when Led Zeppelin played it. So that's it. Well, that's it for episode number 68. Check out rambleonradio.com for notes on this week's podcast, Led Zeppelin news and reviews, and any links mentioned in today's podcast. Follow Ramble on Radio on Facebook, Google+, and at Ramble on Blog on Twitter. You can subscribe to Ramble on Radio through iTunes. Uh, don't forget to leave a review. It helps with product placements. Listen on Spreaker. Be sure to follow Ramble on Radio on Spreaker, and check it out at Ramble on Radio on YouTube. Thanks for listening to Ramble on Radio, episode number 68. Keep it coolin', babies.
switch off the internet. The plane was late. 
uh, and we were staying at an uncle's who, who was a um, uh, prison guard at Wardsworth Prison. And he was meeting, he met us at the airport, you know, and he says, when we get back to their place, it's about 2.33 in the afternoon. We were supposed to be in for, for 11, 12. And um, my aunt says, well, you know, we have the girl next door. She's going to take you because they're going, what are we going to do with a 16-year-old boy? Um, and in fairness, I was a pretty miserable one at that. So she says, well, we have the girl next door. She was going to take you. She's going to take you out one night and do something um, fun with you, take you to the club or something. She says, um, we had tickets to a concert today, but they had to leave. They all, you know, there was a bunch of them, and we, we got you one, too, um, if you wanted to go. But uh, they had to leave. Uh, and, of course, the concert was uh, Nebworth. Uh, so that's how close I came to actually seeing a 16-year-old, like I'm wearing a spray-painted, hand, you know, air-painted air Jimmy Page T-shirt. I have a, a jean jacket with a Robert Plant decal on the back of it. And I'm a complete, complete Led Zeppelin freak. Um, my one thing looking for when I'm in Ward Air 306 by the Arthur 6 right. in through the outdoor because the rumor was it was being released earlier in England than it was in Canada or North America. Um, and and I guess because probably because the dates had been pushed back so many times, the rumor was it was already out in England, but it's going to be a few weeks here. So I was going there with one thing in mind, I want to get my hands on that record. I did come home with that record, by the way. And if you're in North America, and I want to, you should know that they did not shrink wrap them in England what they do in North America, and therefore the brown paper bag is smooth instead of crumpled. The, in North America, the brown paper bag tended to crumple up, tended to get binded. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about In Through the Outdoor next week, because it, it comes up on the, I think it's the 20th is the date. So it kind of comes up next Wednesday, something like that, as the actual date of release. So we're going to talk about In Through the Outdoor next week. Uh, this week we're going to talk Nebworth uh, 1 and 2. Um, but that's my Nibworth story. That's how close I can be that close. So when everybody tells you Ward Air, ah, oh, Ward Air, great service. Ward Air is great. Best airline ever. Ward Air kept me from seeing Led Zeppelin. All you ever need to know. Oh, it's over. Oh, it's over. I say what? Oh, this is Brian. Call me Freddie Bannister Gardner. Coming to you from Ramble on Towers uh, Kitchen Studio. Uh, I'm in the servants' quarters today in scenic Hespler, Ontario, and you are listening to Ramble on Radio, episode number 68. It seems like ages ago I was talking about two-thirds of the way to 666, and here we are at 68, only two episodes later. Huh. Ramble on Radio is the only dedicated Led Zeppelin podcast on this or any other known internets. Be sure to go to rambleonradio.com for all your Led Zeppelin news. Any links I mentioned during the show, you can subscribe to Ramble on Radio through iTunes. Um, if you go to iTunes, leave a review. It helps with, uh, it's a placement thing. It helps us with placement. Listen on Spreaker. Um, and, and be sure to follow Ramble on Radio if you go to Spreaker and listen. Uh, again, helps with placement. Helps things out. Um, and check it out at Ramble on Radio on YouTube. Um, follow Ramble on Radio on Facebook, Google+, and at Ramble on Blog on Twitter. And if you want to have a conversation on any one of those formats, I try Google+, I don't check very much. But otherwise, I try very, very hard. And to keep up with stuff. So it looks like 
uh, when I went for the summer vacation, I actually went into summer hours all over. Uh, so last week didn't happen just because last week did not happen. Uh, habits and, and whatnot. <laughs> Dying hard. Um, yeah, taking, some, taking it a bit easier in the summer. And I did have a full uh, idea for last week. But that's okay because it works this week too. And we're going to go with a bigger... Uh, we're going to talk anyway. You, by the intro, you can tell we're going to talk about Nebworth, Nebworth, 1979. Thirty-five years ago, this past week was the second date. The first one, uh, August fourth, 1979, happened uh, about um, nine days ago. Now, uh, thirty-five years ago and nine days. Um, and and the Ward Air stuff was. I've told the story early in the podcast, but I'm sure a lot of you weren't listening at that point. Um, um, the Ward Air story goes, um, Ward Air is considered one of the great airlines. People talk about its service, everything was so great. My Ward Air experience is, on August 3rd, 1979, I was flying to London with my family. I was 16 years old, it was a family vacation. It would be the last one I would ever take with them. Um, and uh, we, we were 